Hi, my name is Horst Stipp. I'm, I'm with ERF now. Uh, uh, before that, I was uh, in the research department at NBC, NBC Universal, for, for many, many years. Uh, my main job at the ERF is actually to help the ERF to expand uh, global perspectives, but right now we've been working a lot on the uh, neuro standards uh, uh, project. We at we were at N I should say at NBC. I was uh, uh, working on that as a, as a sponsor. Uh, NBC was a sponsor of the initiative. This is what happened. The uh, you know the, the development of science of technology um, uh, is moving fast, and one of the things that had happened was that. Uh, new neurological insights, new, new methods were being developed and were, um, uh, were, uh, were uh, uh, helping to start new companies that uh, did something that's now called neuromarketing, which is using those kind of methods that were originally used like in the medical field and applied it to, to marketing. And so the, so the big promise, if you want, um, the, the pitch to, to marketers is here's a new tool that can help you find out more about the emotions of the uh, of the viewer, especially for commercials. But you know, when I was NBC, um, also for for programs and for for uh, uh, promos, and we all have pretty good methods that we've been using uh, for many many years, and that we be, we find and they work pretty well. But there's always this question: as uh, you know, do people really tell us everything they think? And there are issues like uh, you know certain moral issues what we often call social desirability, that people don't really want to admit that they enjoy something that they're not supposed to enjoy. So um, it looks very promising, but even somebody who's been in the industry for many, many years and, and is sort of like calls himself a, a researcher and hopes that he's a really good researcher, I don't really know much about it these kind of things. And they're really very, very complex. And, and uh, if you look around the companies who are involved in this, uh, they are led by uh, people who are, have degrees in, in this kind of field. So this is very, very complex stuff. So suddenly we are confronted with something that looks very interesting, that maybe some of our colleagues are using, but we can't really evaluate it very well. And so you have like half a dozen vendors, and you can have them all in, and they will be tells you pretty much the same. This is fantastic. My method is the best, and it's between fifty and hundred thousand dollars a pop. So, interesting, expensive, but if we want to try this, who is really, you know, best researcher? When we first started uh, getting interested um, in this, it was a particular issue that we wanted to explore, and that was when people watch the DVRs. They watch the program of the DVR. They time shifted it, and now they have this button, and they can fast forward through the commercial. Does anybody, does, do people pay attention to that? Well, if I would ask you, and, and we know that, most people would say, hey, no, I don't pay attention to commercials. No, 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 no. I'm fast forwarding through the commercials looking back to the program. But what this study that we did showed using biometric methods is, namely eye tracking and some other me measures, that even though people would say, oh, I don't pay any attention, they actually do pay attention. They sort of, uh, Wired to sort of scan our environment, you know. It's like if you, if you, uh, you know, after this, if you leave, and uh, you want to get home, and you're thinking about God knows what, but you're not going to bump into people on the down in Times Square because you're monitoring everything that's around you, even though you're not, you don't think you're paying attention. Very similar. So my point, the reason I'm giving this little case study, if you want, is um, there are certain things for which these methods are really, really great. Now that I was at the ERF, um, that I'm at the ERF, but um, even before that, when the ERF approached us uh, to sponsor this, this project, what they were saying is a lot of our clients, a lot of our members, I should say, are saying, look, we are very interested in these new methodologies, but we can't really evaluate them. Can you help us? Now that's one of the agendas, one of the main functions of the ERF, is to compare methodologies, give independent reviews. That's why NBC start, um, um, signed on as a sponsor. And then now that I'm with the ERF, um, so I'm, I'm kind of working uh, uh, a lot on this initiative. And one of the things we did was we had all of these vendors who took part in, in this process and who are willing to have this sort of scrutiny and, and, and be compared. Um, we had them do the same study 
and then we had an ec uh, panel of independent experts, academics who are like really, really specialists in these areas, evaluate their reports and say, what did you like? How was it measured? Was it measured well? What do you think? And so on. And then on uh, in the third week of January, we had a, what we called our neuro retreat, um, where we got uh, where we all got together, all the sponsors, um, the uh, the uh, reviewers, the supervisors of the review uh, panel, if you want, and um, people from the ARF and um, the uh, uh, the vendors and sponsors all together for dialogue. So one of the really important things happened was that all the vendors. You know, met with the uh, with the scientists and discussed the methodology, and the uh, vendors then also met with the sponsors um, um, and talked about their reports and so on. And yesterday, in the presentation, one of those sponsors uh, from uh, Colgate Palmolive shared some of the experiences. And in a nutshell, I think there were kind of two things: not everything that they said agreed. And it became clear to us that even though this may be based on science, there's still a lot of interpretation in there. And I think that's one of sort of one of the important first first outcomes of all of this. Um, you can imagine this is a, you know it's a business. Um, you know if you want to get hired, you're tempted maybe to oversell your stuff a little bit. And uh, sometimes clients, uh, you know, who hire vendors to do this kind of research, they kind of like simple answers. Well, things aren't always that simple in, in the neuro. Field, the neuromarketing field is still very new. Uh, the one thing that I think is really important to emphasize here is that um, the field is making tremendous improvements constantly. They're learning constantly. And one of the things that is very helpful to them is as they're doing more and more research, they're really learning more and more about what, what means, which method is best, best for what. And I think that's the other really important thing here is that. Um, if you want to use this kind of research, you should really be very, very clear about what you want to find out, why you, why you want to find out, what your objectives are, and discuss that with the different vendors to really find out which of the methodologies really is best for what you want to find out. I go back to this early example that I mentioned. <clears throat> Our question was, do people pay attention? Does anything, uh, you know, get into your head when you watch commercial fast forward. And the simplest answer to, to, to the simplest way to get that answer to that question was, it seemed to us, was this method of eye tracking, which is really very, very simple. And we were able to show very clearly that even though people were fast forwarding, their eyes were following what was going on on the screen. So it was just very simple and straightforward. Now, imagine you're an advertiser, you have a new campaign. You want to reposition one of your key products, maybe a product that sells, you know, like 500 million a year. So this is a really important decision. So you're doing different kind of tests, and I think then you should say, then you should say, well, wait a minute, we can really get some more insights from these new methodologies. I think we really can. But what we are what we are recommending now is to say, look, even though you're talking to an incredibly smart trained scientists. It doesn't mean that you should throw out all the rules of research and say, okay, I don't have to pay attention to anything. He's going to tell me what to do and that's it. No, I think we should work with these guys just as we do always in research with the vendors. To have a conversation about what we want to do, what the goal is, and they should tell us what they do, how they measure it, what is the sample size we need, what, what what does statistical significance mean here? How many people do we need to talk to to really find out what we want to find out? What are the limitations? And, and the outcomes, and this is true of every research including this, is there's always an element of um, interpretation in there. Now, that should not be seen as a negative, right? Because interpretation, if you want to phrase it negatively, would be like, oh, this is not 100% conclusive. No, that's what, not what we're focused about. What we should focus about is that interpretation leads to insight. It's the kind of debate, the kind of discussion that you have based on data that can lead you to get, to get insights that you didn't have before. And I think that's really the strength of these methods. 
you shouldn't take them as you know God given some scientific stuff that I don't understand and just going to believe. You should take them as part of your of your research and as part of all the things, all the data that give you more information that help you move forward. A simple method called eye tracking, which isn't really all that uh, uh, neurological, but that method is usually combined with simple measures of heart rate, galvanic skin response, and common day language if you're sweating, and, and there's a change if you pay more attention. And just to kind of uh, wrap that up, uh, when we did that study about um, uh, fast forwarding. So we had the eye tracking data, people were looking, but we also find, found a small elevation in heart rate and, and skin conductivity. And what that mean, meant was you were paying more attention. Why were you paying more attention? Because your brain told you there's something going on, but it's in fast forward, you gotta pay attention otherwise, right? So that was like a very interesting insight that we got with that methodology. But, like I said earlier, if you wanna reposition like your brand, you have a really important issue um, that involves questions about how people really feel emotionally. Or, if you're a movie company, you get a big movie uh, happening, and of course, it's all about emotion. You have a trailer. You want to convey some of the emotions that are going to be happening in this movie, and it could be, you know, funny, but it probably more interesting when you think about drama, you know, empathy and those kind of things. So the question is, is that conveyed in this trailer? Or, I have two versions of the trailer, which one does that better, right? So now, you don't just want eye tracking, you need to know more than whether people were looking. So, you know, the people who, who do that, um, for example, the company uh, uh, that we worked with at that time, Interscope, they do, they do those kind of things too. But then there are the companies who, um, use EEG or fMRI methodology. So in EEG you get wired up, uh, you get like a wear something on your head and with a lot of electrodes and they try to get into your brain and measure changes in, in, in blood streams and they tie it, they try to tie it with the science on which areas of your brain react when you have different kind of emotions and the intensity of emotions. And then finally the most complex of all measures would be actually putting you in the MRI machine. So it's kind of like if you have a medical test and you know, you're smiling because you're saying, hey, this is pretty intense, you know, to find out if somebody likes a commercial. But you know, if a billion dollar business depends on it, you know, uh, and you may make the wrong decision, this could be helpful input. And the people who are, uh, who are doing this fMRI research, you know, their pitch is to say, look, lots of these things are happening deep inside of your brain. You gotta get, you gotta get deep inside of your brain, and you gotta really try to measure that. And there's a lot of scientific insight on that. So you you kind of have this range. And there's one method that I haven't met, uh, I haven't mentioned that is uh, facial recognition, and it's based on on research that's shown that cross culturally, it doesn't matter where you're from. And I think uh, um, even uh, I think uh, blind people have the same facial reactions to joy. Uh, so, even they, so it's not a matter of imitating having seen somebody else smiling, but it's really sort of inborn. Um, so they, they uh, develop methodology that can detect small, very small changes um, in, in your facial reactions to an exposure such as a commercial. And so they measure that as a tool. And again, um, all these methods have certain advantages and disadvantages. Um, one factor, of course, is you know how much science is there really behind it and how is it being used. I already mentioned to you that sometimes you have an issue where one method seems more appropriate because of the kind of issue they have. But then also practical consideration. Uh, fMRI, most expensive. Um, you probably can't afford, nobody can probably afford doing like 200 or even maybe 150 respondents or so. Uh, so the question is, you know, can you, can you get to what you want to know with maybe 30, 40, 50 respondents? Well, again, it depends on your practical business objective and your particular situation. And that's why, you know, kind of like to, have to say there's not a one-size-fits-all and there's no simple answer. 
because some people say, oh, you had this retreat, you talked to all these guys, so who's the best vendor, right? That, that is not the right way to ask because here would be an example. If you're a company like Burger King who, or, or McDonald's who has like, what, 100 million people, you know, come to your restaurant in the course of a week or a month or so, your audience is incredibly diverse. So maybe it's okay to use like 30 people you know, from different groups and you get sort of an idea. If, you're, if you have a product that's directed at a very, very narrow slice of people, very, very, very finely defined, and you're only testing those people, again, it might be possible, right? On the other hand, um, if imagine you have a celebrity spokesperson in your, um, you know, in your commercial. Let's say somebody like Ellen DeGeneres. Maybe she would test better in the San Francisco Bay Area than in rural Arkansas, right? So there, is, there are cultural things. There are all kind of different kind of considerations uh, that you want to um, consider and have that conversation with the different vendors. So like I said, there's no one size fits all. You really should pick your vendors carefully in any, any research that you do, including this particular kind of research. A lot of these methodologies actually started out with getting reactions to print ads, which are of course much easier to test because things don't move all the time, right? Um, and they're be also being used, you're absolutely right, for um, for products. One vendor told me uh, that they did a very, very big project for a company that wanted to change, um, modernize the shape of a perfume bottle. Uh, uh, another company that they had, they, they had a, uh, was a deodorant company, you know, that wanted to change the logo, the design of, of the, um, um, of the um, package. And again, it's an area, I think, where this kind of research can be very, very important to sort of check what you get with the other methods. Um, there, in, in some instances, you find that the established method um, sort of show you that people maybe are puzzled by change. But then, um, you know, this, is, this provides sort of a second opinion, and, and you can use different kind of tricks to, to vary, vary it. With regard to the example that you gave, absolutely. Uh, I don't really have sort of inside knowledge on that, but it, I could really imagine that companies like Coke, you know, that they would ex use these kind of things to sort of explore the whole ritual, the experience, you know, of, of, of uh, you know, opening the can and anticipation, all of those things. And I think they're being increasingly used for that. There's one thing that you didn't mention, uh, which is something that some people have discussed, and that is to use these kind of methods for political advertising. And that, of course, is another area uh, around this which has created some controversy. I think some of the controversy comes from exaggerated notions about what this stuff can actually do. And you know, there have always been uh, notions about subliminal advertising in God knows what, which have never really panned out. And I think some of the people who are worried about this start with the assumptions that these methods are able to manipulate your subconscious or unconscious or something like that. Now the method itself of course can't really manipulate anything. They can just tell you what's going on and hopefully they're right. And one of the things, um, you know, if you follow some of the controversies here and some of the discussions, there's still quite a number of questions as to how much does the science of this really know about the subconscious or whatever you want to call it or some of these emotional processes and how certain uh, can they be that they can identify certain kind of areas of the brain and really tie them clearly to specific emotions and so on. Um, but even, even if that if that all was all perfected, uh, the problem would not, I, I don't think would lie in the method itself, but whether people are using it, you know, in, in, in a bad kind of way. Uh, but I think that's something, um, you know, that's again true of everything. You can use a simple questionnaire, a simple survey to uh, try to find out, and then your goal would be uh, to manipulate people or do something that, you know, some or everybody would find uh, uh, inappropriate. 
but uh, no, to to sum up, uh, the um, the fields the field is, I think is expanding and and is being tried for all kind of different aspects of marketing. It's a real practical aspect to all of this. One is money; the stuff is more expensive. Another one is that some of these methods are not very portable. So um, if you want to find out what people in different parts of the country think about something, fMRI is going to be really, really difficult to do. Now some of these vendors have uh, developed now tools that are portable, even to the extent that they allow people to go into a store where those and, it can, and they can register whether the placement of a product on a higher or lower shelf makes any difference, those kind of things. Uh, so portability is something that's, that's being developed. So I, 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 would more, I would say that there are sort of limitations in terms of the portability, limitations in terms of the whole complexity of this. If you need an answer to something in two days, this is an issue that is sometimes uh, you know, uh, important in, in, in television, but also I think for marketers who are, uh, for example, want people to get to a movie this weekend, that they want, you want to have really fee quick feedback. And, and these things usually take longer to develop, to uh, analyze, to process, so they don't give you very, very, very uh, quick answers. So I would say those are sort of the, the key limitations.